All right, so thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, very happy to be here. With me is Kishore, and I'm of course going to introduce our guest uh, a little bit later. So first of all, uh, my name is Abhay. I head V45. I head technology at, uh, and, and most of the technology-related operations at V45. I also handle a lot of the training and uh, head out a lot of our training efforts. We do training at Black Hat. We do training at OWASP and several other events, probably a uh, lot around application security, container security, cloud security, Kubernetes, and so on. With me is Kishore, and I'll have him introduce himself. So Kishore. Hey all, my name is Kishore. I work very closely with Abhay in you know, putting training programs, working with universities as well and with uh, many of our clients and conferences as well to put together training programs. So I primarily head the training operations along with Abhay in V45 and happy to be here. Great, thank you. Thanks, Kishore. So now is, I think it's the time for us to talk about our guest. Uh, our guest today is Derek Fisher. And Derek has been an application security leader for some time now. In fact, we've been running into each other often at conferences and stuff, but we're really glad to get a chance to talk to him and hear his thoughts on anything AppSec, InfoSec related. So I'll allow Derek to introduce himself. Derek, all, uh, all over to you. Sure, thank you. So my name is Derek Fisher. I have a couple decades now, I guess I'm aging myself here, but in the hardware and software space and engineering, I started out my career in, in hardware as a drafter and designer for circuit boards. I made the switch over to software and then got interested into security when I was working at uh, Siemens. You may have heard that company, but I was working at Siemens as a software developer. Was really interested in security. Saw a couple of my peers and, and some of some individuals that I uh, really admired there were in the security space and decided to pursue a degree in uh, cybersecurity from Boston University and got into security business. And it's been a wild ride since. Definitely made the right call getting into that. And I know a lot of us that are in the security space truly appreciate being in this industry. It's, it's a dynamic industry. There's a lot going on. There's always a lot of things to learn. And, and you also feel to an extent that you're, you're really providing value to the, to the company and the enterprise that you work in, or, and more importantly, to, to people that are using technology. So, you know, I, I feel like there's, there's a lot of benefit to the work that we do and uh, that we're really bringing good security principles along with us. So been in the security space for probably, I guess, about eight, nine years now. And I also teach a application security course at Temple University in Philadelphia. I've been doing that for a couple of years now looking to expand that actually in the fall to a second course. So a lot of my focus has been not just in the engineering space, but also in the security awareness and, and uh, education space. You know, I feel that that part of our role in, in security is really to be able to provide the means for engineering resources and, and staff to be able to take a lot of the work out of our hands. There's a lot of, I think, uh, misconception that security is security's job, right? Security is, it should be designated to the people that are in the security team. And in some cases that makes sense, but especially in the engineering space, we want to try to enable engineers to be able to perform with security in mind. And one, one of the best ways to do that is, is through education. So. My class that I teach at Temple University is always full. In fact, there's been multiple times where the request has come in to increase the capacity of the class. So that, that to me is, is promising. I think that's good to see that there's a lot of interest in that space. And one of the first things I tell, you know, the students when they come into that course is that having this security background, even if you come out of this with only knowing, you know, the OWASP top 10 and, and, you know, understanding threat modeling risk assessments and some of the basics. And you're going to, you're going to position yourself better as you, as you go out uh, into the world and, and become an engineer. I think that, you know, having these skills is, is certainly helpful. Absolutely. Now, thanks for that, Derek. Uh, that was a really good introduction. I'm glad to see that you're doing a lot of different things, not just, you know, doing your day job. You also have so many other diverse interests, especially teaching and uh, equipping the community. That's really nice to hear. Now we usually start off these segments with a 
how did I get into security thing? And, uh, you know, the question, how did I get into security? And that's another thing that we'd like to ask you. What, what prompted you to get into security? How did you fall in love with it? And, you know, where did you decide that this is what you want to be doing for at least a, a lot of your life? So, yeah, I think it really came down to really seeing where the industry was going and understanding that security was becoming a a bigger factor in, in engineering in general. So, and seeing some people that, that I really admired that were at least, you know, peers that I was working with that were in that security space and, and people that I really um, appreciated the, the, their insight into, into security. I, I, I felt, you know, kind of caught the bug, I guess, and, and felt that it was a good path to go down. There was, there was definitely a lot to learn, you know, security obviously has been around for a long time. It's not, it's not like I suddenly discovered it, you know, and it was like taking off. It was, you know, it's security has been around for a long time. And, and I really, those that have been in the industry for a long time, I have a, a huge, you know, appreciation and admiration for, but, you know, I, I think it really came down to seeing the writing on the wall that, that security was, was definitely something that was becoming extremely hot. I like to kind of be in those types of spaces where I can learn something new and, and be a part of something that's, that's bigger than me. So I, I think it was just a matter of just catching the bug and, and getting on. And like I said earlier, I, I think being, being able to kind of provide that security awareness to, to others. Like I, I feel like maybe in the past security was seen as, as dark magic and it was seen as something that, you know, that was relegated to people that, you know, had secret languages and, and things like that. I, I really view it, and this is why I got into the education space as well, is that I really view it as something that we should, we should kind of demystify security and make sure that everyone has that appreciation for it. Because again, as you see with devices and everyone carrying, you know, a, a smartphone or, or having a tablet and everybody's using technology, it's everyone's responsibility to be more secure. So I, I feel that, that I enjoy that part of it, demystifying security and making it easy for, for regular people. And in fact, I, I did actually write a children's book recently and published it That's related to a security for, for children, because I think, you know, as you see technology kind of expanding, you, you find that, that more and more people are using it. And we want to make sure that those people are using it securely because that, that makes our jobs easier from, from a uh, defender perspective. Right. Absolutely. That's great to know that, you know, you've written a book for children because children tend to be an especially vulnerable group, especially at, you know, when COVID-19 is happening and we have so many different phishing scams all over the place. And of course, children are all at home. They're on their iPads and mobile devices all the time. This, this is a perfect opportunity for people to target them and, you know, leverage them in whatever Know, nefarious things that they want to do. So I really appreciate the fact that you are taking a lot of your time to uh, do these things. That's really cool. So one of the things that struck me in your, when, you know, we were looking at your profile for this show was the amount of work that uh, you seem to have put in, in the secure software development side of things. And I'll kind of continue that question a little bit. You correct me if I'm wrong, started off as a developer. And now you've of course moved into security. So what, what is your take on uh, secure software development? How have you seen this evolve over time? Because obviously you've seen this evolve, different companies uh, doing different things. You are in Siemens, you are now in a, in a completely different organization that's doing something completely different. How do you see this has evolved and where do you see this going you know, in terms of your uh, crystal ball gazing, so to speak, right? How, where do you see this going? Yeah. So. You know, it, it's funny, I, I've worked in the healthcare space, the financial industry, back in my hardware days, I worked in military uh, contractors. So I've seen, seen a lot of different ways that systems and software get developed. And I think, you know, I, I've really grown to appreciate the process. And I know that sounds silly because a lot of people hate process, but I, I kind of really appreciate the, you know, the process of, of making what, what, what we would say, making the sausage, you know, when it comes down to making software. And I think a lot of different, you know, industries and uh, even within the same company, you see teams doing things completely different. And I think that's been, you know, some of the challenges, not just from a security point of view, but from an enterprise development perspective is that teams that are sitting even on the same floor with each other in an enterprise, 
are, are developing their software completely different. And it could be because they're, the language that they're developing is different. Their tech stack is different, but it's, it's always, you know, there's, there's always some difference in there. So, so one of the biggest challenges that I see kind of going forward, you know, especially with security is that how do we, how do we bake in security into that development life cycle? And, right. you know, you're seeing even things like when I first got into security, you know, eight, nine years ago, static analysis was, was taken off. That was the, that was the hot thing, right. You know, that you had to get, whether it was uh, HP Fortify or IBM app scam or, or what are the, you know, the other types of uh, static analysis tools that were out sure. there, you know, it, yeah. was about, it was about plugging them into the development life cycle. Well, now, like, I don't there's not many people using Fortify. You know, a lot of it is because that the way that we develop software has changed in just such a short period of time to the fact that we don't, the tools that worked, you know, seven, eight years ago, don't necessarily work in the same, you know, development life cycle. And a lot of that is comes down to the way, you know, the introduction of DevOps. I think that's made some, some significant challenges in terms of plugging in security tools into the development life cycle. So. As I kind of see things going forward, and, and I know this term gets overused a lot, but w with the, with not being able to rely on tools as much, I think we really do need to look at, you know, shifting left. So how do we build requirements in early on? How do we identify threats and, and uh, risks early on so that we can develop that into the development life cycle and have less right. reliance, you know, on the tools in the back end. There's always going to be, you know, the need for, for those tools down throughout the development life cycle. But as you, you know, build the, that capability and, and understanding of security issues early on, you have less reliance on things like static analysis. Right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Right. right. So, yeah. So Derek, you talked about how things have changed. I mean, how tools were used in the past and how, you know, how they are being used today in the sense they still have a role to play, but you know, they're maybe not as important as they were before, or, you know, they serve a specific function. Now, coming from that transition of how security has changed and today, as you're focusing more on secure software, how has your work in threat modeling figured in the sense that, you know, me and Abaya, we've, we've, we've seen that, you know, threat modeling in many places still continues to be an approach, which is, you know, Abaya likes to use this term a lot, you know, it's like boil the ocean kind of thing. Everything has to be threat model at one single point in time and you create a large threat model, which is very difficult to understand in the current DevOps development process. So how have you seen that change over the years? Because threat modeling used to be a very, very once, once done is done and then, you know, essentially people forget about it. But today with, you know, secure software, how, how does that, you know, play a role in, you know, what you've been doing in the last few years? Yeah. So the answer may surprise you, but I've actually not seen many organizations do threat modeling well. And I, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that to your point, uh, threat models become large, unwieldy, very difficult to meet, you know, manage and maintain. And it's a once and done thing. Maybe you, you know, have this little checkbox where you say, we're going to review it, you know, every year. Yeah. So it, it does kind of become a bit of a, you know, a checkbox exercise with threat modeling. And then you see some organizations that, that just don't have a formal process around how they, how they perform threat models. Not that they're not doing it. They mm -hmm. understand their risks. They understand their threats. They, they are doing it more at a, I'll say like an ad hoc type of method where it's like, okay, we know that this is our risk. We're concerned about, you know, credentials being stolen by our, our, our admin. So how do we lock that down? You know, how do we get a uh, privilege access management the controls around that? So, you know, you, you don't see that more formal threat modeling process as, as often as I think, you know, we would like to see, but as you know, ways of trying to get threat modeling baked in, I, I think it really comes down to making that part of the, the early on process. So that it becomes a tool to develop use cases, requirements, and, you know, ways to validate uh, that you, number, you know, that your controls are working. So I, I think, you know, pulling that again, shifting left, pulling that as early in the process as possible and not viewing it as, as like a security tool, I mean, although it is, but not looking at it, at it as a security tool, but looking at it more as how do we get, how do we get those requirements and uh, use cases out of the threat modeling tool or the threat modeling process uh, so that we're building security in. 
Right. Absolutely. That was, you mentioned a couple of interesting points that I would like to circle back to. So, so first of all, when you were talking about threat modeling, one of the things you said was use cases. And one of the things we have started to see, especially at V45, and we've built a tool around this as well, which is open source, where is to use use cases and stories, uh, user stories to start your threat modeling process rather than have a system wide sort of threat model. This is something that we've seen accelerating threat model and staying as part of the agile cycle. You also said uh, something about most organizations uh, not doing threat modeling well, which I absolutely agree with. What is your definition of threat modeling done well? What would you do? Wish list. So, well, that's a good one. You know, th there's the way I see it being done well is number one, there has to be the upfront collection of data. So things like system diagrams, data flow diagrams that, that are good architecture processes to begin with. So, it, you know, again, set aside the security aspects of that, mm -hmm. especially when we get into this, you know, this DevOps, you know, mentality or, you know, and not using the term DevOps, but this develop code quickly, you know, mentality that we have right now. Yeah. You know, it, I think things like the mundane things that, that, you know, and I was, I was a developer and so, you know, create, creating documentation was always a drag, right? You didn't, you wanted to get in, you wanted to write code, you didn't want to create documentation. So, but I, I think yeah. having that upfront stuff, you know, is, is, should be a priority for engineering teams. So having data flow diagrams, having architecture diagrams, having a system description, like how, how is your tech stack deployed? Where are your accounts? Where's your data? How's it classified? So all those components need to be developed by the, you know, the, the product team or the development team. Once that's created, that makes your, makes creating that threat model easier, right? Cause you have a lot of that upfront documentation. You have, you have things, references that you can leverage in order to create a threat model that, that makes sense. But, you know, there's, there's not a, a single answer for, for, I think, doing it well. I, I think, although maybe there is the, the best threat modeling process or best threat, threat modeling structure is the one that gets used. All right. And that's the bottom line. If you're not using Absolutely. it, it's not, not effective. Right. So, yeah. so whether you're, you're using a tool, whether you're using a, a manual process for creating threat models, it really has to fit the, the engineering team. It has to fit the organization, the enterprise. And it, as long as that upfront uh, information is there. It makes it a little bit easier to create that with perhaps pulling in the security SMEs within the team or from an application security team, having the product owners, the development SMEs get together, make sure that everyone agrees on what that threat model, that it's accurate and then being able to uh, tease out all the, the risks and threats out of that and then acting upon those. So. You know, it's not a one size fits all. I think it really depends on, you know, the size of your organization, the type of organization that you're in and, and culturally, you know, will it work? So I know that's a, a little bit of roundabout answer there, but it's one of those, I hate to say it, it's like one of those, it depends types of, of right. Things. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, it obviously, uh, one size definitely does not fit all. And it's usually a recipe for disaster. It's, it's definitely something that you should look at case by case, but if you were to kind of Str not strategically, but more tactically uh, define what you should do uh, threat modeling wise in the sense that how should we, one of the challenges, let me tell you where I'm coming from. One of the challenges that I've always seen with threat models is that the security team is the only one doing the threat model and that's right. becoming a huge bottleneck, right? And that's, that's the, to your point about it being used. It's never going to be used unless there is skin in the game, right? right? So. Well, how would you, you, and uh, you know, in your years of experience, how would you potentially bring that skin in the game? In the sense, how do you make it easy for developers or architects or business stakeholders to, you know, uh, include themselves or you include them as part of a threat model? And what would you do and what would you not do? Yeah, so I, you know, it really comes down to the engineering team or the the product team owning that threat model making it part of their, you know, their standard process for, you know, and the security team needs to be involved with that. And maybe it's the application security team, or maybe depending on the, the risk of that application, you know, to the risk, risk in the sense of risk to the organization. Like if it's a, a high risk product or application that's being developed, then you mm -hmm. probably want to bring in the full weight of the, the security, you know, the application security team to, to at least assist with that, with that threat model. But I, there really needs to be a co-ownership in terms of 
it, it, the the engineering team needs to own that product you know the threat model itself whether it's whether you do it in a tool and you you know they they need to own that you know that output or at least own you know the diagram of it but but there needs to you know the security team also needs to be able to know that they need to be engaged and maybe that's a periodic thing so they know that every 6 months or every 3 months or whatever that is or every major release that the application security team comes in and says hey you know we know you got your tooling all set up but we we know where your vulnerabilities are because we've been engaged all the time by the way right. have you updated your your threat model and if not let's sit down and, and go through it so so I think it, you know, and in the sense of you know how you develop threat models, whether you're using a tool, which I, I tend to think that if you're using like a, a tool like Microsoft Threat Modeler, or I think it's called AppSec Threat Modeler, if you're using like a, a tool like that to do threat models, a lot of times you know the engineering team can go off and do that on their own. If mm -hmm. you're if you're going down more the manual process where you're in a room, you got a whiteboard, you have the SMEs there. And everyone's, you know, and this, everyone's agreed that we're going to, you know, do this, you know, do this thing, then, you know, it, it's easier to pull people together and get everybody kind of on the same page and engaged there. So, so yeah, there's, there's, you know, it, it really, I, I've been kind of blessed with, with at least the, the company I work for right now, where we like the application security team is embedded with every engineering, at least the vast majority of engineering functions. That's right. that model. It does not does not always scale, and that model mm -hmm. always work everywhere. So, you know, I, I've been kind of lucky with the sense that we're able to engage with the engineering team on a regular basis to mm -hmm. make sure that you know, again, the tooling's working, that they're getting the value out of the tools. We're you know making sure that we're keeping track of vulnerabilities and and making sure they're being tracked, at, you know, close to to uh, completion. And so, building a threat modeling process into that is a little bit easier because we're already engaged with the engineering teams. Right, right, absolutely, cool. So coming back to security awareness, now one of your big areas of focus has been awareness, uh, you know, obviously with your experience in academia as well as your, uh, you know, personal efforts as well. What do you think about now, obviously security awareness is different for different uh, groups of people. Now, when you're looking at engineering teams, especially engineering teams going at the speed of light, so to speak, what is your take on security awareness? How would you look at security awareness for these engineering, DevOps, ops, uh, SRE teams? How would uh, you approach that and what would your uh, take on that be? So one of the things that, that I'm currently looking at is, is, you know, how do we, how do we get the, the basics, right? So there's the 101 type training. So mm -hmm. There's, you know, introduction to OWASP top 10, as I mentioned, you know, teaching at Temple University, the class is always full and, you know, there's, there's always some people still trying to get into the class. So getting those base, you know, I, I feel that that's a, that's a good indication that people are, are wanting to get that, you know, knowledge, but I, I don't know necessarily that we're. I know that when I went through my computer science degree, that there wasn't, uh, we didn't take a security class. You didn't learn that until, you know, later on when you were actually out, you know, in the field. So I, I think, you know, getting that base layer, you know, I'll call it the base layer of, of application security or secure engineering built in, which is, you know, around OWASP and around, you know, secure, secure development techniques and all that. And then, you know, I, I see it as, you know, there's a step up type of, of curriculum where maybe there's more advanced tech things that your developers, your run of the mill developers don't need to, don't need to necessarily take things like threat modeling, maybe risk assessments, that kind of stuff, you know, is more geared towards like the architects, maybe even product owners to an extent, but you know, you want to have basically an add on to that base layer. And then I think mm -hmm. above that, you want to have more targeted focused types of education or awareness where things like container security, API security, right. you know, DevSecOps, like where you have more focused types of awareness training around security principles right. that are targeted again, more towards those people that are in that, that specific uh, channel. Cause the one thing, you know, you don't want to do is, and you know, for most of us, we know this, that, you know, education is not a one size fits all either, right? You don't, mm -hmm. you know, I think 
understanding secure engineering principles in terms of OWASP is great. Everybody should know that, you know, mm -hmm. whether you use it or not, everyone should know that. But as you get into that, you know, things like threat modeling, risk assessments, API security, container security, you know, that kind of stuff is more targeted towards people that are actually, you know, in that space and need to know that. So I do, I right. like the kind of model where, you know, you're able to, to basically build, build skills based on where you're at in terms of the organization. Right. So, yeah, I mean, totally. I think that makes a lot of sense because one of the things that we see, uh, so, and we do a lot of training on DevSecOps and containers and stuff like that. Most of these classes, we're seeing that the lines have blurred quite a bit between the people who supposedly need to take them and the people who are actually taking them because right. everyone is now kind of in this, right? So if you're a pen tester and you don't understand Kubernetes or you don't understand cloud or something like that, you are kind of lost. And so right. the, the audience that is suddenly expanding, we're seeing that with our classes, whether it be at a conference like Black Hat or even our own live online classes, we're seeing that we're, there's a whole lot of different sets of people from management right down to, you know, folks who are doing this stuff on the ground, we're seeing that, you know, take off quite a bit. You know, I think that, yeah. I think, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking that, you know, one of the biggest challenges that, that we've had in, in many of the organizations that, that I've seen and, and worked in is that, you know, finding out who should take those courses, right? You know, it, it's, yeah. you can say the base layer, that 101 course, you know, needs to be assigned to all engineering staff. That you can probably work out. It depends on your organization. You probably know that. But yeah, mm -hmm. to your point, you know, figuring out like, you know, does, you know, does John down the hall need to take the, the cloud security course when he doesn't, you know, quote unquote, work in, you know, in cloud, but maybe not because he has other, you know, other tasks or work that, that kind of bleed over into that. And, and I think right. that's, you know, that's a valid point. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that's, yeah, the, the, the kind of, especially with now with the landscape expanding so much and people jumping into technologies, a lot of times without understanding what the implications of those technologies are. Like right. I see this a lot with cloud and Kubernetes, especially that people just want that shiny new thing and they, they just have it implemented in their project without understanding the massive security downside that they've not really thought about. So that's something, you know, which scares you as well a lot because these are the things that constantly happen and, you know, people are not able to cope with that for a lot of times. Right. The other thing that um, you know, was interesting to me that you've spoken quite extensively about ASVS. And ASVS relates largely, so for those of you listening, OWASP ASVS is a very interesting open source project called the Application Security Verification Standard. Now, the ASVS is currently at V4, and it is, of course, evolving all the time. It's largely a set of very detailed controls on different domains, authentication, authorization, cryptography. Now, uh, Derek, of course, has presented on ASVS at least four or five times based on the talks that I've seen, at least some of the references I've seen outside. What is your take on things like ASVS, especially because these kind of templatized, standardized things make sense to some, but completely don't make sense to others. So where, where do you stand on uh, this sort of initiative? Yeah. And, and you're, you're bringing back, it's been, a, it's been a while since I talked about ASVS, although I, I do, I do talk yeah. about it in, uh, in my class in, in a temple, but, but yeah, it's bringing back some, some horrible memories, but no, <laughs> not horrible, but so, but it, one of the, the, a lot of the talks I gave around ASVS was really how ASVS can be used in, in, in an organization. So to your point, it's, it's, you know, it, it, at its simplest parts, it's a check, it's a checkbox exercise. I think, you know, looking at something like the SKF, the security knowledge framework that is done with OWASP, yeah. there's, there's, they've built in ASVS into the SKF so that, I know there's a lot of acronyms there, but where it's made things a lot easier for development teams to be able to, to understand what their coding risks are in the context of the ASVS. So just to step back and, and kind of go talk about the ASVS, ASVS a little more specifically, you know, it, it has multiple domains and each one of those domains has, has what they call requirements. So, you know, there's, there's an architecture domain, there's encryption domain and, and things like that. 
And in each one of those domains, there's the, these requirements that say verify. And that's why we always got kind of stuck on the term requirements, because anytime a statement starts with the word verify, that's a testing, you know, that's a testing statement, not a requirement. So the, so the ASVS is a way to be used by somebody like a penetration tester or a QA. And that's one of the things that we were actually looking at was, can we leverage the ASVS to uh, allow quality assurance or, you know, testers to be able to use this checklist to, to do security testing for us so that we're not, you know, and again, it's that whole model of defense in depth. So we're not relying just on the penetration testers and our, and our testing tools to work, but we can provide this list, you know, to our QA or testers and say, Hey, can you, can you discover, you know, if these issues uh, exist? And that's a little tricky because obviously your testers are not, you know, security people, but so, you know, the bottom line was that when we first looked at the ASVS, the, you know, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the first thing you see is it says verified, which means it's not, you know, it's not a requirement. So we actually took all the ASVS statements and turned them into actual requirements and then pushed them onto development teams. And okay. we were looking at ways to make that into a, a more approachable method where we had a web application that you can go in and select the functions or the features that you're implementing within your product. And mm -hmm. on that, it would spit out the requirements that apply to you. So that's one of the things, you know, about the ASBS, I forget it, maybe it's 180, you know, statements that are in there. You don't need to take all of them if you're not mm -hmm. using, you know, some of those features that are impacted by those, by those statements. So. The reason I bring all that up is that the SKF, the security knowledge framework has done a lot of that work. So the new iteration of the SKF has done all, a lot of that where, you know, you go in, you create a project and you say that, you know, here are the things that I'm, that I'm, here are the features that I'm including in this project that I have, that I'm working on. And so it'll get, it'll provide you the requirements that you need to be concerned about. And additionally, once you, you know, it's going to tell you like, okay, you're using a database and I'm being general here, but you're using a database, be aware of, of SQL injection. And then when you're complete, completed with that, it's going to give you a checklist that you can then say, Hey, verify that there's no, that you're, you know, scrubbing your inputs and there's no SQL injection possible there. So, so I think the ASBS, there's a lot of benefit to that, um, especially when used in, in the context of something like the security knowledge framework. But what I really, really liked about it was that you have the ability so we don't want to write, you know, as the application security team or as a develop, you know, developer or a product owner, you don't want to have to go out and write security requirements. The nice thing about the yeah. SBS was that they were there. You could just take them off for the most part. You could take them off the shelf, maybe, you know, modify them a little bit, but mm -hmm. you don't have to uh, create that framework of uh, security requirements. They're, they're mostly already built for you, you know, you can use them and, and push them uh, onto the development teams. And like any good framework, there's some customization that needs, needs to happen in order to get it to fit within your own, you know, organization and, and the way uh, your organization works, but it's a great starting point. All right. Um, yeah, continuing to that question or what you talked about ASVS, while you were, while you were, uh, you know, talking about customization and how it can, you know, apply to different teams and how you can, you know, adapt the framework to your requirements. One of the things that we have been, I specifically have been discussing with certain people is that, you know, and this is, and the reason why I'm asking this question is because you have in the recent past or even now working in industries which are very heavily regulated, right? So you're either in finance or healthcare, both are heavily regulated. Now, we understand that ASVS as an application security standard is very good because it talks about things which you can implement. Uh, it's very practically implementable from a development standpoint as compared to other, you know, general compliances and regulations that, you know, your industries have. But when you're looking at large teams, when you're looking at a large product team put together in a large organization, everyone has a different way of doing things and a different way of implementing their products. So what has been your experience in implementing this and customizing this, you know, because you know, in, in a very recent conversation, somebody was saying that, you know, I have a lot of different teams. Some people are very mature in security, so they'll be able to take it up very easily. Some people really don't know what they're doing. So therefore, how do I customize the framework or build it in such a way that, you know, I, I have a standard set of rules, but, you know, it is something that everyone can take up and, you know, start, you know, 
implementing as part of their project. So how have you overcome that challenge, especially in regulated industries uh, such as yours? That you yeah, work? and you know, there was a lot of effort put into mapping the ASVS to other regulatory, you know, frameworks and, you know, like the cybersecurity framework for NIST and for other, you know, types of regulations and such. But, you know, it, it really comes down to, because the other challenge that we ran into was that a lot of the requirements weren't new, right? It wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't, uh, you know, a requirement that said thou, you know, and I'm again, speaking generally here, but, you know, thou shalt encrypt the sensitive data in the database. Well, okay, it most, you know, most mature uh, organizations, most mature development teams are already doing that, right? So, so there was, there was a bit of, you know, going through and making sure that the requirements that were actually being pushed onto development teams weren't ones that were already being, already being completed. One of the ways, you know, and it, it, it's not, it's not going to be a great answer, but the, you know, the way that we found that to work is that there was just analysis that needed to be done when these, when these requirements landed onto the requirements tracker for engineering team, there was just some analysis that needed to be done to just say, are you doing this? Yes or no. And if you are, you know, then you can close this, uh, this requirement yeah. it's already being completed, but we at least had that traceability that said, Hey, you know, and we tried, as I mentioned, we tried to filter down what actually was applicable. So we didn't just give the ASVS over to an engineering team and just say, here, go do all these requirements. You know, it, we tried to tailor it down to what's actually applicable to that team. Uh, and then once they got their list, which could be, you know, it's going to be a subset. So it might be a third or, or, you know, a quarter of, of what the actual ASVS said, then they're able to then go in there and say, look, we're already doing these handful. Great. Fine. Market is, you know, market as complete, provide evidence that it's completed within that, you know, requirements tracking tool. And whether you're using something like uh, Jira or, you know, a, a different type of requirements tool. We just, we just asked that the evidence was applied there, just close it and you're done. So, you know, it, it's, it's not a, a great solution, but it was, but it at least worked for, for the use cases that, that we had. All right. Absolutely. No, that's, that's useful to know that, I mean, there are ASVS a lot of times uh, is touted as a, you know, a panacea that, that can fit all, but I see that obviously, especially with different types of teams. It might be a little bit of customization, a little bit of making sure that it is more easily palatable, I suppose, in terms of its consumption. So definitely that's, that's a valid point. Yeah. Um, and again, it's like sorry. any other framework, it's, you know, it's going to be right because you can't, you know, if it's targeted, if it's too targeted, it's not going to work. If, you know, if it's broad, then it's on you to, to narrow it down. Right. It's like, yeah, any yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think we're almost out of time, but I just thought we'll address one more question and before we close. So one of the things that especially is happening today, and probably you've seen it and experienced it to a certain extent as well, is that we're starting to see this entirely cloud native view of the world, right? Where a lot of these products and even companies are born in the cloud. They're not, they're not even, there is no concept of a, you know, a data center or, you know, them hosting their own services. They are already born in Amazon or Azure or Google cloud, and they continue on that. They scale out on that. We're seeing a lot of zero trust discussed and in some cases mildly implemented as well. And of course, we're seeing a host of new technologies in the identity access management space, as well as of course, you know, at cloud scale, at massive scale. Right. So where do you think, where do you think? Application security, as we know it, is going to go. I mean, how do you think it's going to evolve? And what are your predictions? You know, I, of course, in 2020, I realized that we're not in uh, the best shape for making predictions, but at least around something like this, where do you think we're going? And where do you think uh, you're likely to see things in the next three to five years from now? So I think one of the biggest challenges that, you know, that application security has, has always had is, is number one, keeping up with the technology, you know, number two, keeping up with the engineering teams and making sure that our tools are effective. So, you know, I, I don't see a lot changing in the sense, you know, of whether a development team is going cloud native or whether, you know, they're on a DevOps pipeline or they're going, you know, old school. But, you know, I, I think it just, it's a matter of, of stepping back from an application security perspective and, and saying what's important to us. Mm -hmm. You know, for us, it's a matter of making sure that we're not, you know, allowing vulnerabilities to get out in production. That's our, that's our, you know, that's our stated goal from an application security perspective. So, 
Yep. You know, how do we do that in a way that maybe has less reliance on, on specific tools? And it does come down to, again, I, I know this is always, you know, rainbow, rainbows and unicorns here, but, you know, how do we get, you know, closer to the left and how do we get embedded early on into the process so that we're, we're baking in uh, those uh, security requirements up front and we have less reliance on, on those tools at the end. But I, I do think, you know, especially as we talk about cloud and as, as teams move to cloud native, I'm a big proponent of, of the application security teams knowing what, what security tooling is available cloud native as well. So we don't want to, you know, I think one of the biggest problems and, and just, you know, stepping back and talking about just cloud in general, one of the biggest problems that I think a lot of enterprises realized early on was that picking up your data center and moving into the cloud wasn't cost effective, right? It's not the, it's not the, you know, you're not going to save a, a ton of money uh, by doing that. It's really when you're leveraging the tools natively is where you're going to mm -hmm. see the savings, not just from a, a cost perspective, but also from, you know, from a maintenance and, and, you know, operational perspective as well. So, so I think, you know, likewise, the application security team needs to continue to, to look at those cloud native tools that are, that are available, that will still provide us some coverage from a, from a security perspective, but it really comes down to baking it in early on. So things like security awareness, risk assessments, threat models, security requirements, again, they're not, they're not the, the fun, you know, thing, mm -hmm. they're not, they're not going to get you a booth at a RSA. But they're, you know, they're the things that honestly make it, make our jobs a lot easier. Yeah. The boring things are the ones that actually last. Yeah. Right? Well, you know, it's funny. <laughs> I complain about this every time I go to a conference and walk the floor, uh, I always say, Hey, where's all the app sec stuff. And it's like, it's like, uh, they're in the, they're in the back, you know, where the, where the coffee uh, is being dumped, you know, it's like, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, joking. I mean, there is, there are some uh, tools out there that obviously play in the app sec space, but. They're not, it's not the, the, the firewall tech and, you know, the, we're the less uh, fun uh, part of security. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are getting there. We have lots of exploits coming our way. So we're always keeping ourselves on our toes, but yeah, but yeah, I mean, before we close, Derek, is there something that you would like to say? I, I do realize that your book, is that available uh, on Amazon or something like that? What's the name? Yeah, so it's so I am planning on writing a series on it. So this is the first okay. book, but it's it's called Alicia Connected. That's the name okay. of the series, and it can be found on Amazon, both in Kindle version and on paperback. So feel free to to look it up. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Get more information uh, on me and and the book. I'm actually running a a blog for for the book as well, where I'm releasing kind of that security awareness type of information to to again the general uh, public. So it's it's not security, what we'll call security wonk type stuff. It's more just general security awareness for, for parents and, and for children. So. Yeah. So this is the link for Derek's book. I just found it on Amazon. So if you want to check it out and get your child, some security awareness, maybe this is a book to look at. So, and of course we'll also post Derek's uh, blog information as well on the show notes once we release this episode. But yeah, I mean, it's been a great time talking to you, Derek. We really enjoyed ourselves. And I think all our viewers and listeners will find this to be uh, worthwhile of their time. So thank you very much for taking yeah, the time. Appreciate the time. And this was, this was great. It's, it's always good to kind of talk, you know, application security. Cause again, like I said, we're not the, we're not the, the fun part of security, but it's, you know, I think it's obviously, I think it's important cause that's, that's why I'm doing it. So. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you. And uh, yeah. Thank you very much.